Hello. Welcome to uh, Platform, this uh, lecture series here at the Bergen Kunsthal. Um, my name is Steiner Sackingstad, I'm the curator here at the Kunsthal, and tonight we are here on the occasion of the opening of Knut Henrik Henriksen's exhibition Notes to Stones, which is not opening in our building, uh, but uh, is an exhibition taking place off-site over at the town hall building right across from here. And I uh, assume that uh, most of you have maybe seen the exhibition already. Uh, if, it's not, if not, it's a good occasion to go over there after this. It looks good in the daytime as well, and it's in the nighttime, actually. Very nice daytime, actually. It is. I'm not going to say uh, too much. Um, uh, Knut Henrik will do the, the speaking here. But um, it is a very um, good pleasure for us to be able to open in this exhibition after... Uh, over two years of waiting time. Um, we invited Knut Henrik, I think, two and a half years ago when um, for a project uh, that was to take place exactly two years ago uh, at the time when we were renovating this building and we, we did uh, several exhibitions outside of our own venue, different places in Bergen. And we invited Knut Henrik uh, with a quite open invitation to do something somewhere. <laughs> and. Uh, he very quickly um, decided that he wanted to do something around the uh, Rodhus beginning, um, the town hall, um, and around Erling Wiegsche, the architect uh, who has uh, designed that building, and specifically maybe the material that Wiegsche is famous for, this natural concrete. Um, so uh, Knutanuk developed this project and it was really finalized uh, almost uh, when we got the message from uh, Bergen Kommune that the facade of the building was falling down and uh, there was no way that we could uh, do the project as uh, planned. Um, so we decided then to do make it into a two-part project. So in very short time Knut Henrik developed a part one of the project that uh, was called Echoes took place on the facade of the Kunsthal and in a very nice way mirrored the building in weight of the project that was to happen. And at that point it was to happen sometime in the future and we didn't know when. Um, so been, we had been waiting and, and a strange coincidence that it's now happening almost on the date uh, two years after it was supposed to. So it's, um, <coughs> it's really nice to be able to open it tonight. And I think this long process has also been very good. It certainly has been great to, to be able to have this long-term conversation with Knut Henrik about the project. It's been ongoing uh, ever since, really. And I think it also, uh, in a strange way, is, is manifest to his way of working that this thing uh, happened. And, and, uh, it's, and um, the way that Knut Henrik works, he's able to incorporate these kinds of frustrations and accidents uh, into the artwork itself. And uh, it's exactly this kind of architecture, uh, architectonic frustrations uh, that he has made um, into his uh, working process in a way. And I think that's what uh, he's going to talk a bit about today. Probably about this project, but also on several other projects that uh, might demonstrate to us a bit of the way he, he works as an artist. So, welcome. Thank I you. Like Thank you. So, um, um, many of my sculptures, I, will, I work with sculptures, and very many of them are based on the architectural situation of where they are shown. This means like the space the volume are often um, designing all the shapes and the shapes uh, and the um, public volume that has changed over time are defining the sculpture in a way. And I will show you a couple of works that I produced for like 10, 15 years ago and go a bit up to, to show you some work that is kind of related to, um, to the Bergen project I'm doing here now. Um, <coughs> the first project uh, which had some kind of interest for me now. It's like the, 
uh, one I did at Hamburg Bahnhof in Berlin. It's the Museum of Contemporary Art in Berlin. Um, I was invited for these typical Nordic shows that was produced in the 80s. And uh, the curator said, well, Knut, try to find some interesting place in our building to install one of your more monumental sculptures. And I was walking around the whole museum and I, it was really difficult to find something because after the wall fall down in Berlin and they build up this new museum, it was all renovated and neutralized. There was nothing more kind of museum that has a character in the space. So very frustrating, after working a whole day in the, in the museum there, I kind of walked up the stairs, you see it over here, want to go to Walter Koenig to buy some books, lots of frustration, I walked up the stairs there, and suddenly I kind of feel that the space is kind of narrowing in a very absurd way. And I'm kind of suffering a bit of a light uh, claustrophobic uh, thing, so, so, um, so I thought like, hmm, what's going on here? Why am I getting this kind of feeling of something narrowing? And if you see on the lines here, it's two spaces meeting each other. The big hole you see behind are meeting a very odd area after the staircase there. So I started to investigate these kind of invisible lines that is lying just in the middle of that image. And looking at historical images, I found that this is the old railway station of Hamburger Bahnhof. The Museum of Contemporary Art looked like that before. The trains from Hamburg came to Berlin into that area, then going back again. Then, in 50 years later, they build this a gigantic kind of a hall that you see in that image. This hall was built 50 years later, and it was just like put on top of each other. So, <coughs> the line I'm talking about is actually a line where two buildings from two different time periods are colliding and meeting each other. You can see on one side a very classicistical shape of it, and here you see a more ornamental style. I blocked the whole museum with my wooden sculpture, as you see. And you see the, uh, the classicistical shape of it. Then you walked around the whole museum, and it looked like that. This is like 30 meters by 15 meters high, and this is 18 meters high. And you see the two different types of building techniques. But just as you see how it actually constructed, you see it like this. It's actually a line, it's a sculpture, it's a line, it's an open space. So here you have the one area, you see the people working down there. On the other side you have another shape of the sculpture. And <coughs> I call this sculpture architectural doubt. Because I saw, I just imagined the frustration situation that the architect to build this, class, uh, this uh, or more ornamental structure and how we joined them. And if you see here, on that image, for example, the first image here, you see on top there, it's a very unclear situation in the building. The classicistical shape is just going higher and the other one is going lower. So, <coughs> So a public volume that has changed over time is defining my sculptures. I then made another project, for example, in Swiss, in uh, Fribourg. It's a bit of the same project. I was invited for uh, Kunsthalle Fribourg to make a public work, a temporarily public work. Um, I was walking around, looking, and that's one part of my work, like finding a place where I can install the work. Walking around in this beautiful medieval city, I found this tunnel underneath the street here. The street was built in the 50s as a function on, on top of a city wall. And this is the, uh, and this is the old historical entrance. Walking here the one day, the second day I passed this area, which is actually the exit of the tunnel. So here we have the entrance, and you see it there, and here we have the other area. And 
if they um, this kind of absurd volume that uh, appeared because when the street was lying on top of the town, it was blocking the whole. Um, they had to lower the ceiling, of course, and then to use the tone, you have to build up this kind of structure with a, with a tube bar. So what I did, I used this very absurd volume to make the sculpture, which I called Ghost. Ghost as like architecture, as a ghost, present and uh, past. And I built it in a classical Norwegian technique, uh, Westlands panel, which we'll see here later. But also from the Christian Sun, where I spent most of my childhood. So I painted as a white ghost house splitting here. You see the technique. And if you, that is actually the, uh, the profile in the space. So the sculpture is actually a cast of that volume. You're walking in this old historical entrance, and here is the new entrance. In the um, Kunstmuseum Bern in Swiss, they invited me uh, a big collection there to how can we collect Knut? How is it possible to co collect my work? Because they're all tear down, they're all damaged, uh, but still, hmm, let things new. Knut, can you do something for us? I went to this museum and I was interested in this area, which is where uh, Atelier 5, uh, it's uh, the students of Le Corbusier, has built an extension of the museum. Um, <coughs> very many of my sculptures is actually based on architectural uh, things that went wrong in the construction sites. I tried to make a monument about these errors appearing. Uh, not like saying, okay, blah, blah, you made something stupid, but like making a kind of poetic monument about things that went wrong. So I was walking in this kind of building here, and I kind of find out that in the basement, they have blocked the windows. You can't see through. So I had the plan drawings of the museum, and I was looking, well, where's the windows here? And I said, like, we, we, we blocked it because we have problems with the condensed water. When we have it open, we have all these water pearls on the windows, and the water is leaking down, and we're hanging Picasso next to it. It's not working, so we had to block it. And I thought, like, okay, this has to be a sculpture. So what I do is I kind of make in the wall where the windows are a cut opening up, and making a sculpture out of it. So I take the material that's already existing, making a shape that is defined by the proportions of the space and tilting it up. And the sculpture is called A Story About the Sun and the Moon and a Chipboard Removed to Reveal the Pearls of Water. And I, many of my sculptures actually called sun and the moon. And it's about like you can't see the man, moon because of the sun. If not, if not the sun is shining on the moon, you will see, not see the moon. And it's the same how I kind of see my sculpture at some point. You can't see the space without my sculpture. I mean, like my sculpture is not existing without the space and the proportions of the space. So uh, this was installed at one place. And this is the other one that I built in the other wall, uh, window that has uh, been uh, hidden. And you see my neighbors of the next, on the left side. <laughs> it's good. Um, I very often s uh, organize material more than I'm cutting it. Um, the museums, the shapes of the buildings are defined the shapes of my sculpture. In uh, Frack, in uh, Nantes, I was invited to have a residency. I stayed there for a while, and in the end of the residency, you should also have an exhibition. Um, it's a classical kind of modernism, modern space, exhibition space, and they 
have built these kind of uh, light boxes up in the roof that I find interesting. It's completely formal, funny thing. And what I did, very simply, old sculptural technique, how to move parallel lines down in the space. I took all three meter long material and pushed this as high as it got up in the light box. The light box looks like this, it's a concrete with a window throwing indirect light down in the space. So all the material are three meters long, I just push it as high as it gets. And you get that. So it's a cast of the space. So in, uh, in, in Europe and in, in, um, in, um, in um, yeah, like in Europe in general, I mean, like the, the wood is kind of standardized in different lengths. And in Norway, it looks like that. In Norway, it's like it's no kind of um, standard formats of uh, material and lengths. They're all kind of going in random lengths. So this is the piece I made in Momentum, where I just hang the old material. I made a tribute to the produ production. I didn't make one cut in this material. I just placed them. But what you have when you look through the, um, through the windows, you have the sawing mill from uh, Petersen Fabrik, where you see the uh, sawmills outside, like that, mountain of sawmills. So then you kind of get a bit like a melancholic expression of the sculpture. You're also reflecting a bit of the history that I uh, was talking about in uh, the Hamburger Bahnhof and the architectural doubt show. Uh, Mr. Le Corbusier is uh, kind of uh, taking a lot of my time. <laughs> um, the first show I kind of was interested in was like I always wanted to make a show about um, the Norwegian empty space of architecture. Like 240 height, the highest ceiling in Norway is. And I wanted to find that as a sculpture. Um, during some time, I uh, came over Le Corbusier for a while, and I made then a sculpture based on the Modeloid, 226. 226 is a height that uh, Modelier, uh, Le Corbusier invented uh, based on the classic uh, handsome man, which is called six feet tall. He actually wanted to use his own height as measurements. He was very rigid on his systems. But uh, at some point, his measurements was very difficult to calculate. So then one of his assistants said, like, well, use the handsome man, six feet tall. So that's why it's six feet tall in the, in the drawing of Le Corbusier. And based on that, I made a sculpture based on the empty space. I just lowered the ceiling to 226. Ba built of this styrofoam, this very ugly material that you are used in temporarily spaces in Berlin very often. You're going into a cafe, you lower the ceiling, you lower the heating cost and you have a nice time and when you're moving out you just rip it off and everything is clear and nice. When you walked out of the gallery, it looked like that. And this is the first Le Corbusier exhibition I did. And um, the, the title of the show is actually based on the meeting of Einstein and Le Corbusier. He was so excited to travel to America to meet Le Corbusier, to present his mathematical system about the proportions in space and Modulorman and everything. And Einstein told him that this is a scalar proportion which are, makes bad difficult and good easy. So that was the title of the show. So Einstein is actually the title there. Um, I can show... Uh, I very often work with standardizations. Uh, standardizations was uh, mostly in standardized around like uh, in the industrial time where they're starting to build huge construction, steel constructions, and um, they had a need that they don't always need to calculate things at one, uh, over and over again. So if you want to build a bridge, you know what kind of dimension you need for building that bridge. So the standardization was kind of helping to remove doubt. Um, and as you know, doubt is a very essential thing in my sculptures. I find wrong things, I find doubt, I, I, I 
making monuments about them. And <coughs> I took the sheet of A0, A4 formats, and started to make monuments about that. And like a standardization is very often based on horizontal and vertical lines you see here. And I started to make diagonals and making sculptures. This is an A2 cut diagonal mirror placed on top of each other. Open the ceiling like that. So I'm breaking the whole system of standardizations like that. And this, for example, is a show that I call Monument of Doubt that I did in Hollowbush Garden for a long time ago. Inside here, you see all the invisible lines. That actually is all these sculptures based on standardization uh, formats. Curves inside paper, I cut it in steel, welded, painted white, and made this monument about doubt. Um, about public works, um, King Cross Station in London, um, a couple of years ago, I was invited to do a, pub a public work in, in, the, in the tunnels down, down there. Um, when you're doing this public work in London, it's so complicated, it's so kind of bureaucratic, because there's so many security issues you have to take care of. There's so many um, problems with the fireproof material. So they said, like, if you don't want to have this material in, you have to make this certificate and this certificate. So it was actually an invitation of 200 pages I got. And it's one page with the leather, and the rest is what I can't do. So I decided to make a monument about that, what I can't do. So I decided all the materials, which are already proof and existing inside the tunnels, is going to be my material that I'm going to use. It's going to be drawn by the architect who already drew, is going to, dry, uh, to, drew, uh, <laughs> to draw all um, the, the new terminal hall here. And it's also going to be installed by the people who built the station. So I'm not going to touch anything here. I'm just going to make a kind of a ballet, a kind of a monument about the material, the workers, the architect, and the situation. So the material I got is the sandblasted aluminium, the steel, steel, the wall. And what I did, I took just the missing link of the circle and the same material built a structure and lifting that up. So it's kind of the missing link underneath the roof that I'm kind of lifting up as a sculpture, leaning, standing like that. And this is called the full, full circle, it's called. And here you see people are working in it. Anyway. So you see, it's like in, in, for me, like I'm, I don't have any assistant. I just like go on the site and kind of working with the situation. I find things that I find interesting that I'm actually not allowed to do something in there. Uh, in, if I don't hire people, it's too complicated. So I just like tilting things on upside down and making a monument about it. Another public work where I'm making a momentum piece like that. Um, so, I just show one work more and then we can go to the Bergen piece. Uh, just another Le Corbusier piece. Um, uh, Villa Savoy, um, one of the most iconic villas from the modernism, where you have the pillars and you have the roof on top and you have all these kind of nice details from Le Corbusier. Uh, the idea behind this building was that you should come from behind with a car, and it was like designed for that car, you come behind, drive around the circle, you see in the shadow there, the people are standing out, and the chauffeur is driving into the garage. You see like that. They come from behind, take the curve, and straight into the garage. So <coughs> the proportions of that curve you see there is actually based on the Citroën 1927. That is actually 
defining the modernistic, classistic uh, proportions in the villa. So why should a Citroën 1927 do that? Why not a Cadillac? Why don't uh, a Ford? What, what's the issue with the Citroën? So I thought like, okay, um, this is very unclear. So I decided to see what happened if I took my car, an Opel Astra 2006. So the turning radius of uh, a um, Citroën 1927 was like, uh, I think it's like 16 meters, and my car is 11 meters. So I took and built the curb again, like that, freestanding. And the sculpture is called uh, Villa Savoy, redrawn with an Opel Astra 2006. And the funny thing is like, the building behind here is actually in Rüsselsheim in the Opel factory, standing outside now permanent in Opel, like Adam Opel's son, Fred Opel, he lived there. So this is now a sculpture that is now belonging to the house, which is nice. And I work with Opel, my papa worked with Opel, so I'm kind of an Opel man. Yeah, and here you see the difference in the curves the Astra curve and the Citroën curve. Um, okay, so let's talk quick about um, the Bergen product. This is the starch. It all started with the bus stop. This is like a bus stop that you find everywhere in, Oslo, in Norway. And it's, um, it's a kind of thing that I'm grown up with. I kind of always sat in there and you slept there when you have been in parties and it stank there. It was kind of an emotional thing, <laughs> these kind of bus stops in a way. And these small stones, I always was fascinated about them. So when Bergen invited me to do this, um, this project, I was walking around, I was interested in the development of a, a Berlin city in the 60s walking around and I find this building and I find this space and I see the stones and I'm kind of fall in love with it. And <coughs> I started to develop a, um, a product as uh, Steiner said and uh, that product uh, fall apart uh, two months before installment. But in um, For the, for the first product, I then kind of made this kind of elements of echoes, like an architectural echo reflecting the sites from here over here using these structures and the forms around the windows. And it looked like that. Um, and it's also made of this material that you can actually make a concrete cast of later. And this is one of the ashtrays you see here. Uh, there. It's one of the ashtrays that you see in the exhibition. I made a kind of a sculptural object out of it, based also on the column that has scaled down 50%. Mm -hmm. um, And for the new product, I kind of was interested in how the Bergen Rodhus was kind of working as a compass. If you look in, this, in, in, the, in the city here, you always oriented vertical around like uh, where the, uh, Rathau, uh, the, um, the city hall is staying. Go to the right side of the city hall, you go to the left side of the city hall. It's like working as a kind of a vertical compass where you are in the city. So I decided to break that logic and make a horizontal compass. And that's the story about this line here. So <coughs> I wanted to tinkle the, 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 the Vixu a bit under his feet, so I made this kind of half circle, tilting them in north, south, east, west direction like that. So it's a big, big compass actually what's under there. And you see like this.
Um, the other product, you see the elements of the, the, the columns I used before, the bird in space, I call them. And <coughs> I found this company up in Voss that was actually producing them. And, uh, the, um, and I went up to them, and they're specializing in this kind of material. And <coughs> there was kind of a bit like arrogant when I came up, and like, oh, what's going on here? And it's like, oh, just make your sculpture, we get your money, and you, you're happy about it. And I was like, oh, give me some love in these things, like, give me some interesting. And they said, like, well, here's the sand, they gave me like 16, 16, uh, 60 uh, liter of sand, just throwing it out. And I looked at the sand and said, I can't use this sand. It has to be nice stones. I mean, like, look at the, the, the beautiful Viksha building. It's all this kind of beautiful, the same size stone everywhere. And I kind of sitting here with just crap because he took all the bad, good stones. And I'm sitting with the crap stones because it's kind of the same area where they're picking it up. And the stone, big stones are lying on the top. So when I go away, you have the crap. So I started to take all the stones out that I liked. Hand-picked like, <laughs> I think it was like 40 kilo or something. I'm really desperate and I'm really sitting there with the cold water in this cold, uh, I hated it. But it was kind of an intimate thing also because like when they saw I was sitting there, they started to like it. They were kind of like, okay, if you're doing the love, I'm, I'm going to show what I can do. And then I kind of took all the stones I was sorting, the big stones, small stones, I was going to throw them away, and we started to discuss the sizes of the stone, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, and then it was this moment that this was going click, okay, they want to show me something. And <coughs> we took all the stones I've been like doing for two days there up there and sorting it out. They started to mix it, and that's a very beautiful thing. They started to mix the stone into the concrete. And the thing is, like, you have to be very, very precise where you had to not take too much of the sand, you had not take too much of the water, and you had the chemicals, and it has to be really on the milliliter. Really, really precise business there. And um, because, like, it, it, it can melt like uh, mayonnaise if you stir like egg and oil, it can go like this. And the stones has to be on the same height because every stone can go down and it looks really horrible. But then it was kind of stirring it and they're kind of doing this thing. Like, and it was very excited. At some point it just turned out the white in his face and screaming, come on guys. And all the guys was running looking at the sand, and the boss came, and he said, like, well, more stone, more stone, more stone, more stone, more water, sand, sand, sand. And they kind of got so excited, and it's like, yes, now, now, now it's working. And they started to dig all this kind of thing into the, um, into the, um, the, the shape, the cast here we have done. And it was, they were so happy about it. It was such a love thing. It's like, this is serious. I mean, like, it's, I don't know if you know the, the movie from Andrei Tarkovsky called, uh, uh, from, from Andrei Rublo. The, the small guy running around and trying to find the, the to make the, the, the clock for, for the new church to save his life. It's a bit the same. It was such an um, exciting moment for them and for me. So this is the cast we made, just as you see the process behind the sculpture. And in the shapes, we have added some acid that will make the concrete not to strengthen so we can wash it away afterwards. So we have a concrete thing, shapes with acid, and when it's coming out, you see the milky thing. Inside is hard, outside is still a bit soft. And we sprayed it, you see here, very, very slowly, very, very gentle. Viksha used the sand, we, uh, we used water for this because it couldn't pay it if it was using Viksha's technique. And this is how it, is made. And there it is. My bird in space. And that's the other one. And <coughs> then also the, um, the, the um, other product which I will also show is like the, the, the surface of the Brutalist building that is interesting is like how can we make concrete human? How can we make concrete nice? And very many, uh, this is from Hayward Gallery, I think, in, in London. They used all these kind of um, wooden structures, which you get as the, the surface of the, um, of, the, um, of the wood inside the concrete. 
and Wieksche, he made the stones. But if you look at the whole facade here, you see this. And this is actually a Westlands panel made a structure and sand blown, which I then took the proportions of the material and made that one in Le Corbusier colors and make a uh, fillerie like that. Yeah. This is kind of perhaps what I wanted to say. I have an image of you, Stefan, but I will not show that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some questions? Questions? Um, I will run over with the microphone to you. Hello. Um, I'm curious, did you uh, talk to any of the architects behind the buildings you were working with? Or I am. Um, yeah, Vicksho is dead. Yeah. I yeah. Mean but uh, you mean the architect of? Um, no, or if people you who's ever involved with it, or no, I'm I'm just thinking that these projects would be interesting for the architects behind them. Obviously, most of the buildings are quite old, so with these projects you've shown here, probably you wouldn't have had the chance. But if you had made other projects where you discussed it with the architect, we discussed with the architect. Um, Hmm. I don't think so, actually. Uh, Atelier Fünf, they are still alive. <laughs> no. Um, what do you think about the... the, the um, things that went wrong in the building to discuss that with them, or...? No, I, I, I'm just curious if you had like a conversation with them or yeah yeah, yeah no. well say like that I'm, I I've been um, the the architect when I'm doing the project is sometimes a bit like uh, they get a bit stiff because I'm putting out things that went wrong in the building they get like ah uh, come don't come here and teach us how to do it mm. but I tell them always it's not about that yeah. it's more about making a poetic uh, uh, sculptures of things that went wrong and put that in the center. That hasn't to be like making fun of people or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, so, so architect is a bit stiff in the beginning because I'm talking about it, but I understand that I'm actually not want to make fun of things. Mm. I just want to make a beautiful poetic monument if yeah. I can do that. Mm. And that's what I also see under here. I mean, the monument. You, if you if you look at the birds I'm producing, for example, those here. You you know that the facade in Bergen is falling down. And this is the element is actually with falling down. So it's actually a, a bird about, uh, I mean, like that's a sculpture about that. So if you see in the facade, this is the element that is falling down that I'm putting in the center of the exhibition. Hmm. Hmm. Hello. Hi. Um, I guess that something that is very interesting about this is that um, you're often working with uh, two uh, architectural structures coming together in different time frames. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, there's really no problem in either of the particular structures that are uh, built independently. Mm -hmm. But it, the problem arrives when they meet. Mm -hmm. So you, in a sense, are the one to solve the problem. And that yeah. is mm -hmm. really interesting to me. I don't know if you can speak to that at all, but, uh, but the architects as such aren't really creating problems. Mm -hmm. You are discovering the problems that arise because of history, mm -hmm. because of the historical discontinuities, discontin mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can speak to that. No, but that, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the main thing. As you saw, the first product is like two buildings that is just colliding on each other. Right. And it's such an unclear situation. 
And uh, I felt very uncomfortable about that space in a way. And like this has to be articulated new again or put a point on a way. Um, um, yeah, what else are you going to say? Um, But I don't know uh, what I'm going to say about it in a way. It is. Um, I don't know if I'm going to ask you. I'm going to say more. Uh, I'm a bit tired, I have to say. <laughs> 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 I'll do my best. Um, We have another question for you. Yeah. I mean, like it's 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 also like this kind of area in 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 South London Gallery, you know, like it's. I don't know what it is, but you're kind of entering this beautiful Victorian building in a way, and you're just walking in, and you're looking so much forward to make a project here, and you're walking into the door, and you see this kind of alive. I mean, like it's it's such a beautiful museum. Everybody's using it as a kind of a workshop. People are hanging out, having a good time, but look at the doors there. They have a beautiful floor underneath, really beautiful, like a very, very old Victorian floor. And then, as sorry about this, but London, England people, they put carpet on everything. And they also did that in London, uh, and the South London Gallery. They put this kind of massive uh, wood structure overneath to protect the old structure there. But they had the problem to meet the old structure, of course, and that's why they're sanding you see the gaps there. You see, I put a, a, a beam over just um, to, to show you the, um, the, the, the thing here. Everything is going down. So when you're entering the space, you're getting really seasick, you know. It's like, whoop, and then suddenly you're in this beautiful museum. But you see, look at the, the skirting there. It's going like this. All structure meeting new structure. Sanding it down. It's a completely strange thing. So, um, yeah, the product didn't weld. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of... I like to find those things that, that I'm, I feel uncomfortable when I'm entering the space, but still I kind of... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, I was curious about, uh, if you go back to the, the Baron project, um, mm -hmm. how so much of the work seems to be responding to these very specific existing conditions that are, you know, um, collisions of styles and complex forms. But you seem to bring a kind of platonic pure geometry to that of the circle. And what you called it? Oh, platonic oh, yeah. pure mm -hmm. geometry. Mm -hmm. um, which sort of reminds me of Gordon Matta Clark and how he would carve a circle out of a of sort of messy existing shape. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that, sort of the reasons behind bringing that form in. The form in like that? Yeah. Well, um, you see many of my sculptures actually based on circles and curves, say like that, in general. And this is a very old technique that architects are using to, to find a kind of a harmony in a building. Then building a classicistic building a villa, for example, if you take diagonals, curves, and circles around here, uh, Notre Dame building, you can do it. You can always see how the structure, he, uh, hidden structures in the building where they're meeting the windows, where the windows are ending, and stuff like that. So it's a kind of a technique of using circles and those kind of shapes in architecture, visualizing invisible structures. We started with that. So, but um, of course, there's references to uh, Gordon Matta Clark here in a way. But it's also for me, it's as much interesting to also to be next to uh, a George Brock hanging there in a way, because it's, uh, actually all my sculpture is drawings, and then with the drawing is lines that I'm kind of tilting up and making a three-dimensional sculptures out of them. So. Um, And, and you also see that all the proportions, I mean, are actually as high as the building can be. I will once make a sculpture that is a bit bigger than the building, and then we'll see what happens. But that's, of course, the building going to collapse, of course. But it's also interesting to think of. 
but until now I made all the sculpture just defined on the proportions of the space. Um. I was actually wondering about the same project here, because you said that the kind of idea was that you're going to give them an idea how to collect your work yeah. with this. Yeah. So this work now is a part of their collection. But different from the neighbors that you have here, your sculpture is not very mobile. Kind of it's no, this is it destroyed. Is. Yeah, so what, kind of, what do they have in their collection? Is that the drawing, as you said, that your sculptures are oh, drawings? Or is that problem. the actual? <laughs> but, no, yeah, well. <laughs> that's, re that's really their problem. That's why they invited me. Well, they have uh, lots of these kind of um, metal sculptures that we went on to, to sell them also, of course. But this structure, I, 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 I think it also has a number in the collection. But it's also uh, entitled, I think, also destroyed. I think it is like that. <gasps> so, um, because now, now they also renovated the building. Now it's open. The windows are open. So that's like the good thing about it. They saw how beautiful it, the view is out there. The, you can see the whole alleys, uh, the alleys from, from, uh, from, from the windows in the burn, through the windows. So it's really nice. <gasps> Mm. Any other questions? If not, uh, thank you once again, Kirit uh, Fantastic uh, talk, and thank you for everyone for coming. Uh, the exhibitions. Uh, at Kunsthal, the other two exhibitions that we're showing at the moment, Robert Overby and Kira Phillips, uh, are open until 11 o'clock this evening. So, uh, and the party continues uh, until the late hours, so stick around and uh, thanks for coming. Good night.